Oh, very good. Come on in, everybody. Please find a seat. I'm going to have to use my father voice here in a moment to get all of your attention. We have some traditions at Westbrook, and one of them is starting late. Um, so we're trying, trying to um, not do that. My name is Mark Whiting, and I am an elder here at the church and the administrator. And I just want to welcome you to a time that we gather together to worship Jesus. That's what we're here for. Um, just some real quick announcements. I'm, I'm not known for always going quick, but I'm going to try to this morning. There's a black folder in your file, in your, in your row. Um, please fill that out so we know who's here. Um, we, we love to know who's here and, and keep track of that. Um, we've got a lot of busy things going on. We had a great Boulders meeting yesterday. I just hear that, know that from what they've told me. We had an elders meeting, so I didn't get to attend. But we've got other meetings, and I want you to know about them. We have a, a prayer meeting tonight. And it's from, it starts at 5 o'clock. It's an hour. Um, it's a great time to gather and get before the Lord and, and, and pray and remember that he hears all those things, that he never loses track of those. If we have 50 people in that hour, then we've got 50 hours of prayer before, before the world that, that's in need. And I would tell you, I've had a couple of people just this morning. This body is in need. There are needs in this body. If I ask you to raise your hand, if you've got needs going on in your life, whether they're health or financial or whatever, most of you would put your hand up. So you're sitting there thinking, I'm the only one that's hurting. That's not true. That's not true at all. So we can be praying for each other. I know we're praying for the service today. Janice looked at me this morning and said, we're winging it. Chad's not, Chad doesn't feel well. Chad's at home. And so, so Tim and Janice are controlling. They're going to do a great job, but, but they're feeling a little nervous too. Look at, look at that face. So... So, so great. Um, for that prayer meeting, we're going to Zoom that too, in case you're not able to join us. On the 19th, we have a candlelight service. This is also weird for me because you know I'm a wanderer, but there's so many things up here I'm nervous about tripping over something. So on the 19th, two weeks from tonight, we have a candlelight service. That's also at 5 o'clock. Um, we will live stream that for folks that aren't here. And I want to make a comment here relative to something. I always get to talk about COVID. I'm not going to talk about COVID today. The, the news is crazy about COVID right now, again, still, maybe. Um, but but I, the comment I want to make is relative to how we come to our service. If you're comfortable, we, we want to allow a lot of freedom for you to choose what's best for you. And if that means going without a mask, that's, that's your choice. If it means wearing a mask, that's great, too. I'm going to encourage you guys not to judge each other. It's really easy to judge in our world, isn't it? For one reason or another, and we have no idea what's going on in the heart of another person. So let's make sure that we don't. If you feel the need for more um, distance and so forth, the community room is really set aside for people who want more, more freedom, more chance to put a mask on and have more social distancing. So if I didn't say that right, forgive me. Um, but that's, that's a topic that we... We always want to address and make sure everybody's comfortable with that. It is um, a time of year where there's a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm. We have traditions, we have decorations, we have uh, services, we have presents, and so on and so forth. And it's real easy to get lost in that enthusiasm. It's also a hard time for some people. We think it's always an exciting time, and it's not a great time for some people. We need to, we need to remember that which led me to a passage of scripture that I want to share with you. Um, I never would have gathered this if I read it on my own, so somebody else gets credit for pointing this out to me. But it's in, it's in Psalm 61, and I write that down and go home and read it. But it, he says, David, who's being pursued, says, lead me to a rock that's higher than I am. Whether you're in great high emotions today or not, there's a rock that's higher than you are. And David said, I need to be led to that. So he says, lead me to this rock that is higher than I am. For you have been my refuge, a tower of strength against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the wings, in the shelter of your wings. What I want you to see in that is the increasing intimacy that he says. He said, he said you have been my refuge. That's a picture of the wilderness when he's running and hiding from, from Saul and he's running and hiding from Absalom. He says, there's a place in the wilderness that I can take refuge. And then he heightens it and says, a tower of strength, that's the city. So now he's running to the city and getting closer to the Lord. And there's a tower that he can run to. 
And he says, let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me live in your, in your home. That's a picture. That's the same word as tabernacle. Let me live in your tabernacle. And then he said, and then I can take refuge in the shelter of your wings. See that increasing intimacy all the way through there? We talked this time of year. My, one of my favorite words this time of year is Emmanuel, that God is with us. That God is with us. And see that intimacy that God desires no matter where we are. No matter where we're high or low, he wants that intimacy, and he provides that. He makes a way for us to do that. Psalm 61, go home and read it tonight. I failed to make one other mention, and this one's a weird one, but the, this time of year, one of the traditions that we have at Westbrook is to um, say thank you to the staff for what they, for what they do. And there's, there's an announcement in, in your bulletins on the weekly and so forth that says we'd like to, <laughs> this, this is hard, since I'm a staff member, are you catching that? It's hard, but I'm, I'm reporting for the finance deacons because Steve Woolhite is hobbled and he didn't want to walk up here and make the announcement. He said, so would you please make the announcement on behalf of the finance deacons? And there's, there's an opportunity for you to say financially thank you to the, to the admin staff here and say thank you for what you do. Instructions are in, your, in the bulletins and so forth. So with that, let me pray. Father, slow us down this morning. Um, whatever's on our heart that distracts us from, from worshiping you, God, just take that out of the way. Help us to, to know that you are at center stage this morning, that it's not about us. It's not if the songs are our favorites or the, the sermons, the right length or whatever, God. It's about you that we gather and we want to worship you. Uh, you deserve to be worshiped, God. You're an incredible, incredible God, incredible creator. You love us and you want intimacy with us. Thank you for making that happen. And we just want to worship you today. Amen. I'm not done yet. You thought I was done because I did that. Um, Altifers, would you guys come on up? These are one of our, these are our core one of our core missionaries. Um, they are from <laughs> one of my, one is Andrew and one is Hannah. I'll let you guys figure out which one is which. Um, I think they are happy to be here because if you guys thought it might have been a little cool this morning, I think it's 35 degrees cooler in Juneau this morning and good chance of snow. So they, I don't know, maybe you want that, maybe you like that, but they are going to talk to us about joy because that's what the Advent message is this week. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, when Chad asked us to light the Advent a uh, candle and we accepted and he told us that the topic was joy. Um, pretty much the, the first thing is I started considering joy and just how we've experienced joy in the last year. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was James 1 uh, verses 2 to 3 where he says, count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And working at camp, um, it's easy sometimes to take your focus off of ministry, um, to turn your focus towards yourself, um, and in doing so, uh, rob yourself of joy. You know, when, when you uh, have a camper who, uh, it's their first time away from home and they cry every night because they're homesick, um, or when you have to run night game at midnight and it's raining and you'd much rather be in bed, you don't count it as joy, right? Um, because me personally, I'm uncomfortable, right? And my focus is on myself. And something we started doing this year, actually Hannah started it, when our program staff meets for devotions, uh, at the end we go around and ask everybody what brings you joy? Um, and it's really great because it, it makes you stop, think, and get your focus off of yourself, and it's like, okay, despite the circumstances, despite all the, the things that I have to do that I'd rather not do, what is in my life that brings me joy? Um, because as believers, we, we always have access to joy, we don't always choose to tap into it, right? We have to get our focus off of ourselves, back onto Christ 
and then we'll find joy because Christ is our joy. Um, and no matter what the circumstances are, uh, we have good news of great joy uh, that we can, we can enjoy every single day. Luke 2, 8 through 14. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Thank you, Andrew and Hannah, for that reminder that our joy is in Christ. And carrying on with that theme of joy, our first song this morning is Joy to the World. It's one of the most famous Christmas carols of all time, as you know, except you might not know it's not a Christmas carol. It wasn't written that way anyway. Isaac Watts wrote Joy to the World 300 years ago with no thought of Christmas. He wrote it to put music to the words of Psalm 98. But we claim it as a Christmas carol, and I think rightly so, as Hannah read that portion from Luke 2, and the angel, after announcing the birth of Christ, behold, I bring you good tidings of which shall be to great joy to all people, joy to the world, right? Let's sing, let's stand as we sing joy to the world. the kids up for a children's message with Mike Sullivan, and as you're sitting down, just greet somebody that's close to you briefly, briefly but warmly. <laughs> gather around, gather around. Look who's here. Wow, look at all the kids. Good morning. I've missed you. It's been over a month since I've gotten to speak to you. And I'm not wearing flannel today. I'm wearing corduroy. It's very soft. Well, welcome to week two of Advent. 
And if you're like me, you're probably thinking, what does Advent mean? Why do we call it that, and where did it come from? Briefly, Advent is our word for the Latin word Adventus. I might have told you that a year ago. Adventus. Can you say Adventus? Use your hand. Adventus. Sounds Italian. It means coming or arrival. And it goes back as far as 1,600 years of church history where we began to celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And last week, we lit the hope candle. This week, we get to light the joy candle. And I'm so thankful that that is part of this season that we talk about and celebrate joy. Did you know that God is a joyful God? He truly is. We have an enemy named Satan who despises everything about God And he whispers to us and says, God is an angry God, and you're the reason that he's angry. And that's just not true. In fact, the Bible has joy referenced in it over a hundred times. Sixty times in the Old Testament and forty times in the New Testament talks about joy. And God is a joyful God. When Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God was joyful in that moment. And Jesus spoke to the disciples about joy. In John chapter 15, he talks about My father is the vine dresser, and I am the true vine. And he talks to them about them being branches and by being attached to him. And the benefits and the blessings of that communion, that attachment to Jesus. And then he says, I have said these things to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus is really the author of joy. Joy is personified in him, and we get that by our attachment to him. And in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he's praying to God the Father, and he knows that he's getting ready to leave the earth and go to the Father. And he says, and now I have said Now I have said these things to them, and I am coming to you, that my joy may be fulfilled in them. He could have said a whole lot of things. He could have said, now, Father, I'm coming to you, and I really hope they got what I said. Or, I don't know what's wrong with these guys. I keep telling them and telling them, and they keep making mistakes. He didn't say that. He wanted his joy to be fulfilled in us. And I think I learned something just recently with that. I think for the first time, God revealed to me that Jesus' joy is not fully complete until it is experienced by us. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I was looking on the internet for pictures and videos of things that I thought represented joy. And I found this picture that um, we'll see on the screen, I hope, momentarily. Um, And really, if I could show you what I wanted to show you is videos of people that were reunited with lost pets. And you talk about joy, just the joy, the sheer joy of the animal and the human being. I see so many things here, and one of them on the left looks like joy. Look at the expression on the lion's face. The one on the right actually looks like comfort to me. He looks like maybe he's sad, I don't know, and then the lion is comforting him. How appropriate, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. (laughs) Sorry, that was cheesy. Last thing I want to tell you, I'm, I'm really thankful that God could have 
given us different things to focus on during Advent. When I was in school, ninth grade, I went to school up the road here at Westridge Middle School. At that time, it was Hillcrest Junior High. And I had a math teacher named Mrs. Scott. And everybody in my class, except me, saw her as an old, cranky woman. But God gave me eyes to see the beauty in her soul. And she had three words up at the front of the class. Responsibility, respect, self-discipline. If she were in charge of the church, those would be the Advent candles that she would light. (laughs) And God could have done that. God could have done that. He chose not to. Can you imagine? Hi, my name's Mike Sullivan. I'm here with my family, and I'm delighted to light the responsibility candle. We have hope, we have joy, we have peace, we have love. I'm so thankful that God is so good. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for giving us your joy that the Father and the Son are one in their intent for us to be joyful, and I thank you that you are a joyful God. Help us to experience your joy in all its fullness and watch over these children, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mike. That's a deep thought, isn't it, to think that we can have Jesus' joy in us, something that really we spend our lifetime being reminded of. Our next song this morning is Angels We've Heard on High, another old Christmas song that we know. But uh, after the angel of the Lord had shared this good news about Jesus' birth, remember it says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. That's the chorus of Angels We Have Heard on High. Glory to God in the highest, except it's in Latin. Here's two times this morning you're learning Latin words. Adventus, is that, is that, was that it? My, Adventus, now, glory to God in the highest in Latin is gloria in excelsis deo. That's glory to God in the highest. So we have the opportunity as we sing together to sing with the host of angels singing glory to God in the highest. Let's stand and sing glory to God. Angels we have
song is A Little Town of Bethlehem, and you, you may not have thought about it, but you might recognize that, that first in the first verse, we actually sing to the town of Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still. But then by the time we get to the last verse, we sing, pray to, O oh, holy child, Bethlehem, which becomes more of a prayer. May that be our prayer today as we sing, O oh, holy child, or O oh, risen Jesus Christ our Lord, O oh, Lord, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Oh, come to us. Abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. scripture reading. We're going to read uh, Luke 1, 26 to 38. It's the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the same and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb 
and bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You can see it. Be seated. Thank you, Scott. There are some fantastic helps for children at the back of the church this morning. If you don't have them, you're welcome to go get them or pick them up afterwards as well. Thanks, Helen, for that, and thanks, others, for that labor. Let's just pray. Oh, Lord, would you do something to our hearts through the Bible by your Holy Spirit? Lord, I consume myself with trivial things. I can think all day about things that are not worthy of a moment's thought. And I can think for just a moment of things that are worthy of hours of thought and worship. Lord, would you please, by your Holy Spirit, work some miracles in hearts today. Miracles, Lord. Miracles of faith and amazement, and overwhelming us with truth such that we will get to the place where we can say with Mary, I am the servant of the Lord. Do what you want with my life. Bring us there this morning, please, as we prepare to take communion, Lord. Lord, thank you for Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all who have helped this morning. And Chad, if you're watching us, we love you. You're amazing. Thanks for your ministry week by week. And those of you out in TV land, we welcome you. We're glad you're watching us this morning. If, if you receive the miracle of the incarnation, God becoming a man in Jesus, the grand miracle of Christianity... If you receive that as true, then every other miracle in the Bible falls into place, and you have no trouble with them. Jesus walking on water, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, turning uh, wine, water to wine, all the wondrous miracles of Christ are 100% plausible if you receive the grand miracle, which is that God became a man. Through the Virgin Mary and these glorious truths at Christmas are the profound truths of the saving story of God. Remember we said last week that God reveals salvation to us through stories, true stories, not just ideas. He, he could have just downloaded some, here's ten facts, believe these and you go to heaven. That's not how God has done it. He's done it through stories, wonderful, true stories. And now we're culminating the salvation story of history with the birth of Jesus Christ. I pray that you take Christmas for all that it's worth in a godly and holy way. God's salvation story moves from the hill country of Judea. Remember Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah's name, God remembers, Elizabeth's name, his oath, the promise of the coming of John, who would become John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, preparing Israel for the Messiah to come so that people in 2021 in Overland Park, Kansas, would understand the love of God, the redemptive work of God, 
God's salvation moves from Zechariah and Elizabeth in the hill country of Judea to a town in Galilee named Nazareth to a young girl. She would have been somewhere between the ages of 12 and 16. Mary. Those were the ages of betrothal in Israel. A young girl named Mary. There is absolutely nothing in this story that would have fit into the contemporary Jewish mind. Galilee was waste country. Nazareth was nowhere. If you were inventing a story to amaze and awe people, you would not have anything come from Galilee. Nothing come from Nazareth. But that's how God works. God is not amazed by the big and the fancy and the impressive. God is a God of the small and the unimpressive. Here's the angel Gabriel again. Remember, we met him last week. Two angels named in the Bible, Gabriel and, Mar and Michael, but hundreds of angels in the Bible. And Gabriel is always the one who brings good news. He appeared to Zechariah, and we remember Zechariah's response was, prove it. And God chastised Zechariah with silence until John would be born. We'll look at that in a week or two. But here, Gabriel visits a godly young woman. Can we just stop there a moment? We're going to spend two weeks on Mary. We know that our friends in the Catholic Church, if they make too much of her, we make too little of her. A godly young woman, a woman with a history with God. You want to have a history with God so that when God comes and knocks on the door of your life, you are ready. She's a virgin. She was sexually pure. And the angel comes and says to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Just stop there a moment. What does it mean to be favored by God? Let us not think for one moment it means Mary's going to have an easy life. Trace the life of Mary from this moment on, and whatever favor means, it does not mean easy. And for many of us, our goal in life is to have as carefree a life as we can possibly have, and then go to heaven if there happens to be one when we finally die a carefree death. That is not on offer by Jesus Christ. It's not on offer by God Whatever favored meant, it did not mean easy. It meant, Mary, you are going to be a part of the salvation history of planet Earth through bearing the Son of God. And I want to say this. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives, for he has favored us in Christ also, but do not confuse favor with easy. And let's settle it today that we want to be in God's will. But that does not mean an easy life. Too long the church in America has been poisoned by the prosperity gospel. Every single one of us have gotten it in our heads that if I follow Jesus, life should basically be easier. Well, it, sin does make life hard. It really makes life hard when you have to lie and cover up and you wonder, you know, all the tragedies that sin brings. But following Jesus shapes us for heaven. And we need to get it into our understanding right now that God has not called us for ease, but for purpose. And listen to Gabriel's message to Mary. 
She was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Angels always have to say that to people. And he says four vital things. Number one, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son. Now, Mary has never been with a man. The mystery of the incarnation and the wonders of the virgin birth are vital and essential to our understanding of who Jesus is. God was incarnate in Christ, not in the normal manner. There was no normal procreation here. Now, when Zechariah and Elizabeth had a son, John, that was miraculous, but there was normal procreation. That didn't happen here. You will have a son. Number two, you will name him Jesus. Matthew tells us that the angel said to Joseph in a dream, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, Mary will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The word Jesus literally means Jehovah saves. Jesus came to save us from our sins. He didn't come just to give us some ideas. He didn't come fundamentally to teach. He didn't come fundamentally to heal. He came to save. And this is what Gabriel says to Mary. You shall have a son. You will call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. The third thing he says is he will be great and will be the son of the Most High. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The Son of the Most High. That's a divine title. Gabriel comes to Mary, this godly young girl, and says, you will have a son, he will save their people from their sins, and he will be the Son of God. And he will sit on the throne of David forever. And the Lord his God will give him the throne of his father David. This is a kingly and a messianic title. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom he will sit to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever. I became a happy follower of Jesus in 1975. How many of you were not born yet in 1975? Raise your hand. Okay. I was at college. I was 18 years old. I met Christians who really believed in Jesus for the first time. Now, I'd grown up in church, but going to church doesn't make you a Christian. I met real believers in Jesus. I met my wife there a real believer in Jesus. And one thing I was confronted with was this. You cannot be ho-hum about Jesus or the word ambivalent. This story and the four things the angel just said to Mary, Mary, you're a virgin who's going to have a son. Mary, he will be the savior of sinners. Mary, he will be the son of the most high God. And Mary, he will be the Messiah and King, and his reign will never end. Those four things are either the most profound truths imaginable, in which case they should totally re-circuit our lives every day, or they are the most profound lies ever pressed upon the human race in which case we should close this church as fast as we can and stand against Christianity for all we're worth. What you cannot be about Jesus is ambivalent. You are either all in or all out. 
And one good thing that is going to happen in our generation is the church in our generation is going to be pruned because there are many of us who are just cultural Christians. And that must stop. These four things that the angel said to Mary are the most amazing things imaginable. So Mary comes with a question. And Mary said to the angel, verse 34, how can this be since I am a virgin? Now remember, Zechariah had a question too, but his question was with his chin jutted out. Prove it, God. Mary's question was humble. It's okay to ask God good questions, but it's not okay to question God's goodness. Ask him your questions. That's fine. God, how are you going to do this? Now, there are many, many pagan myths whereby a God comes down and has intercourse with a human and produces a divine child. There are many stories like that. Nothing like that was happening here whatsoever. Those are counterfeit stories and perversions. There's no evidence here of anything less than holiness. The story leaves us wondering and marveling. I'm going to be frank. Had this been a pagan story there would have been some sort of sexual experience. But Mary says, nothing's happened to me, I'm a virgin. This is holy and godly, breathtaking and supernatural, and we are to wonder at it. Gabriel says, God will overshadow you. This will cause the child to be born to be holy. Somehow, the line of sin from Adam will be cut. This will be a holy child. Hate to say this, moms and dads, none of your kids are holy. <laughs> they need Jesus, they need redemption. We are born in the line of our forefather, Adam, with a sinful nature. This was cut off in Christ. The Holy Spirit will do this, Mary, and so this will be a holy child. And look at Mary's surrender. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Most High will overshadow you. And so this child will be the Son of God. And even your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. She's in her sixth month. Verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. The whole story is predicated upon that. Nothing's impossible with God. And look at Mary's response. Verse 38, Mary said, behold, I am the servant, literally the slave. The slave the willing slave of the Lord, may it be to me according to your word. Let me ask this question. How godly can a young person be? The answer is very godly. This is a 15-year-old girl here. And she does not say what I was saying at 15. This is what I was saying at 15, and I wished I wouldn't. What I was saying is, what about my life? What about what I want? What about my plans? What about my friends? What about my goals? Elizabeth Elliot said this, so much of what we call struggling is simply delayed obedience. So much of what we call struggling is simply delayed obedience. There is joy and freedom in Mary's surrender. And her words, which were vital to the redemptive 
purposes of God right down to our knowing Christ are also to be a template and a model for our hearts every day, every single day. You can pray the prayer that Mary answered Gabriel with. I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever you're going through, I am not here for my own purposes. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be according to your word. There's freedom in these words. Mary would have known Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Every follower of Jesus should memorize this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. She would have known those words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. What can your surrender and my surrender mean to God's greater purposes? What is your delay costing? Do we think we can do better with our lives than God can? What if Mary had said, well, actually, God, I have a better idea. There are two words you cannot say together. Think about this. You cannot say the words, no, Lord. Because as soon as you say no, he's not Lord. You can only say, yes, Lord. Settle it today. We're going to take communion in a few moments. The grand miracle, the amazing wonder of the incarnation should produce two things in us, faith and surrender. Faith and surrender. I have faith in Christ as my Savior, and I surrender to God's purpose in my life. So much of what we call struggling is just delayed obedience. I have to tell you a story of another young girl, Sophie Scholl. She's a new hero of mine. I don't know if we'll have a picture of her come up. There she is. Sophie Magdalena Scholl. She lived to the ripe old age of 22. She died in 1943. She was a Christian and an anti-Nazi political advocate along with her, father, with, her husband, with her brother, Hans. Hans was a medical student at the University of Munich. She was a student at the University of Munich. They were imprisoned, convicted of high treason, And beheaded for distributing anti-Nazi literature. These were her final words. How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually for a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day and I must go. But what does my death matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? Sophie was a Christian. She was a follower of Jesus. Her brother Hans had a profound and clear Christian conversion while at university in medical school. They died together on the same day. She also said these words, the real damage is done by those millions who just want to survive. Honest men who just want to be left in peace. Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear, it'll show their weaknesses. Those who don't like to make waves or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principles are only in books. Those who live small, die small. 
If you keep it small, you keep it under control. But if you don't make any noise, perhaps the bogeyman won't find you, but it's all an illusion because we all die. People who roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to stay safe. Safe? From what? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues, and a little candle burns itself out just like a flaming torch. I choose my own way to burn, said Sophie. She was a kindred spirit to Mary. Sophie, who understood that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus was the Savior of sinners, that Jesus was the King, understood, I cannot seek safety and security in a world that is trying to destroy people. Be it done to me according to your will, Lord. Because I do this, I have seven books about Sophie. Thanks to Helen in the children's department. Seven people can get these. Moms and dads, I would ask you to get them and read them before you read them to your children. But if we don't know about people like this, our world will be infinitely impoverished. Knowing Jesus produces faith and surrender. I'd love to give seven of these books away this morning. They're beautiful. They're expensive. They're serious. It's not a Christian book. She was a Christian. This is a history book written from that aspect about her life. You cannot be ambivalent about Jesus. If he is the savior of sinners, if he is the son of God, if he is the king and Messiah, then nothing else can be the same. If he isn't, then we're cast into an empty universe with no hope. We're going to take communion today as a church. Because this baby born was, Christians believe, going to be our crucified and risen Savior. And as you take bread and wine this morning, and if you're visiting here and you believe in Christ as your Savior, you are welcome to join with us. Moms and dads, you please decide how you do this as a family. But as we take bread and wine, can we consider two things? I confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, and the King of kings. And I surrender to him. That the words of Mary might just ring in us, I am the servant of the Lord. Do what you want, Lord. And see what he does with your life. What I'd like us to do is stand and we're going to affirm our faith as we do in this church with the Apostles' Creed. And then after we do this, um, I will pray and then Janice will come and lead us in some quiet music during which we think and we ponder and then we will share communion together. Sophie and her brother Hans would have known this creed. The truth in it is what motivated their lives. And this creed exists because Mary said yes to the will of God for her life and bore Jesus. Let's affirm our faith together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' holy worldwide church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. Janice, will you come up? And as Janice plays, let's prepare our hearts to receive bread and wine together. holy thing to thank Janice. Can we thank her for that? Thank you so much, Janice. Jesus loves you so much. 
and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And those words that Mary said, whether you're 12 years old this morning or 8 years old, or whether you're 50 years old in the middle of a career or 80 years old with uh, strength waning, those words of Mary are for you to pray today. I'm the Lord's servant. Do what you want with me, Lord. And God can take your little life and my little life surrendered and do amazing things that only eternity will show us what that is. And if you're a child here today, my plea to you is don't delay. Don't wait like I waited. I was 18 when I came to Jesus. I sinned an awful lot before then. If I could do one thing different in my life, I would have come to Jesus sooner. And if you ask any Christian that question, he'll say yes, me too. Don't delay. Jesus is wonderful. Communion is wonderful because in a world that is changing, this is not going to change. We will gather around bread and wine and remember the Lord's death until he comes again. No matter what else happens out there. Amen? Amen. Of this we have centered our life upon. If you have any comfort from his love, any encouragement in Christ, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, then make my joy complete by having the same love, being in full accord in one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to those of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was yours in Christ, who, though in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's prepare to take the bread. You open your little thing. This is the body of Christ. It reminds us of the body of Christ broken for us. Take and eat this in remembrance of him. Lord, we pray that every benefit of your perfect sinless body broken for us will be ours. Work miracles of grace in our lives as we remember your body given for our sins. Likewise, this cup is the blood of Christ shed for us. A new covenant for the remission of our sins through the blood of Christ. Take and drink this in remembrance of him. Lord, we bless you for your shed blood and in humility and faith, we trust in you and we make, Lord, full and glad surrender to your purposes for our lives. Lord, thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude our service with singing the first Noel, or you could say the first Christmas written hundreds of years ago, but just to give us a glimpse of shepherds, wise men, and our response. We have just three verses of this we'll finish up with, with some scripture in between. And I want to first 
Look back again, as we have more than once today, at Luke 2, where the angel says to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you, unto you, is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. chapter 7 verse 14 therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel from Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 15 the king of Israel the Lord is in your midst you shall never again fear evil that God has touched your heart today in some way. I want to remind myself and you as well that joy is what carried Jesus to and through the cross. Hebrews 12, 2, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And let's not confuse joy with happiness. Happiness is conditional. Joy is eternal. Twizzlers make me happy. <laughs> the Chiefs winning makes me happy. I'm sorry, John. 
13 years ago, a tornado came through and ripped off part of the roof of our house, and then it was followed with freezing rain, and we had water in the house. That did not make me happy. But it didn't take away my joy. Because joy is something that is knowing what's on the other side of our circumstances. And joy, because Jesus knew what was on the other side of the cross, could be joyful. I'm sure that he was not happy when a cat of nine tails was ripping the flesh off of his body. Could not have been happy in that moment, but he was joyful. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think... According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.